The time has come. I like that. The time is now for Victoria Stellwell's Positively Podcast. She's a world-renowned dog trainer. Seen enough dogs today, have you? She's the host of It's Me or the Dog. I'm coming to train you. Along with co-host Holly Furfer. You don't play around with that name, do you? I am a fan of sweaty balls. She's Victoria Stilwell, and she's ready to go. This is a lovely way to start the day. You get the busy bee. I need to trim my whiskers. I see some poo here. I feel a little bit better now because I'm the only one who usually feels stupid during the podcast. Now, let's head to the studio and get this Positively Podcast started. Hi everybody and welcome to the Positively Podcast. I'm really glad that you can join me today. And do I have a special guest for you. I'm so excited to have uh, this amazing man who has written this wonderful book. In fact, one of the, my most favorite books that I've read called Dog is Love. Why and How Your Dog Loves You by the wonderful Clive Wynn. He is also going to be a, a speaker at the Dog Behavior Conference, May 9th and 10th. And that is an online only conference, of course, because of the coronavirus pandemic, we had to shut our conference down in the UK, but we put it online. It's now an international conference. And if you are interested in joining us for a weekend of incredible speakers, please go to register or you can find out more information by going to positively.com slash DBC. So Clive is going to speak to us in a minute. And um, I just, I hope that you guys are doing okay. Obviously, we are in certainly where I live in Atlanta, Georgia. We're in about our nearly our fourth week of knock, of lockdown. And um, it's it's all very strange, but we're, we're coping and our dogs are coping too. But what this has enabled us to do is that every weekend, every Sunday, we've been getting on to Zoom with the VSPDTs, which are called Victoria Still Positively Dog Trainers. And we are offering free Q&A for an hour for anybody that wants to ask questions about their dogs and all their dog behavior, their dog's behavior. So this is really exciting. And we decided to do it. One of our trainers, Sam White, suggested that we, we do this so that we could answer people's questions at this time. And it was so successful and has been um, such... A, a great resource for people all over the world to be able to talk to amazing trainers. We have anything from around 10 to 20 trainers on our time to answer questions that we've decided to keep going and do this every Sunday for, for as long as we need to. The other thing that we've been telling people is that if you have a dog, you have a behavior issue, you've just got a puppy, you're fostering, you've just adopted then um, you don't have to wait to take it to training because all the VSPD trainers do virtual consultations, which means that if you have a computer and a camera or a phone and a camera, then you can do a virtual consultation. And actually what we're seeing is that more gets done in virtual consultations than in, in regular consultations. And, um, and so that you know, you're not really losing anything by doing a virtual consultation. So we're saying, look, people, don't wait. Continue. You can train your dog. If you have a puppy, you can still help socialize the puppy and you can get some great tips by coming and um, to and attending our free webinars on Sundays as well so that you can ask any questions that you have to our wonderful VSPDT trainers. So now is the time this is a um, a real treat for you all, but I'm going to go straight to the phone and get Clive Wynn on the line. The Positively Hotline is ringing. We don't know what we're going to do. We have no plan. We're just here. Who's calling in this week? He went after her like she's made out of ham. That is interesting. That's exciting. Um, is somebody going to answer that? Hello? Hotline ringing. You're on your phone, and I don't think you're taking any of this seriously. It's the phone! Ladies and gentlemen, let's go! Welcome to the podcast, Clive. How are you doing? Victoria, I'm fine, thank you. I'm thrilled to be with you. We're doing fine. 
What is life like for you in this pandemic? Well, I think I'm very lucky, very privileged. You know, it's not such a radical change. I mean, I work, I have this home office. I work from home a lot. Anyway, the fact that I'm having to work from home and only from home, that is a change. And, and I, you know, I'll be glad when we can get around and about again. But I think compared to what so many people are experiencing, I'm in a very lucky, privileged situation. I'm, I really cannot complain too much. Well, I am really, really happy that you can join me. And it's a, it's a big honor that you can join uh, me. And also to tell everybody that, you know, a, a little bit more about what you're going to present at our conference, the Dog Behavior Conference on May 9th and 10th, but also about your book. Now, I love your book and I'm showing it to our to our viewers on Positively TV, our our listeners are on the podcast can't see it, but we will be putting a link up on the podcast page so that you can see this amazing book. Um, and I'd love to be able to ask you some questions about the book and why you wrote it. First of all, you are you were born and raised in the Isle of Wight, so you are a Brit, but like me, you now live in the States. That's right. That's right. Exactly. What brought you over to America? Well, I didn't come straight to America, Victoria. I had a bit of a sort of a, how long do we have? <laughs> um, I mean, the long and the short of it is that the United States is just such a wonderful place to do science. You find that, you know, you visit the, the universities of the USA and you find the whole world gathers there because it is just such a fantastic place to do science, especially behavioral science. You know, psychology was not invented in the United States, but it certainly grew to adulthood in the United States. Uh, so, so that would be the short answer. <laughs> it's just such a great place to do what I, what I want to do. So for people who would like to know a little bit more about what you do, can, can you give a condensed version? Because it is vast. So if you could do a one minute version, that would be great. So I have two, I study dog behavior. Everything I do has to do with behavior of dogs and their wild relatives. And I have two really things that I concentrate on. One is what the heck are dogs? What makes dogs special? Dogs are so unique and so amazing in this world uh, that we put a certain amount of our research effort goes into just trying to understand dogs and particularly in comparison to their wild relatives, wolves and coyotes and whatever and whatever. And that a large part of that is what went into the book Dog is Love. But then if you would have come and visit us, Victoria, which would be wonderful, you really should someday, and you would have just follow my people around as they're doing their daily work, you would find that the majority of our time and effort goes into trying to help dogs. Because a lot of dogs, through no fault of their own, find themselves in difficult circumstances. And the real pointy end where we have put a lot of our work over the years is dogs in shelters, which is... You know, I mean, euthanasia, thank goodness, is declining, but the shelter remains a tough place for a dog. And so a lot of our work over the years has gone into trying to help those poor mutts who find them through find themselves through no fault of their own in kennels in animal shelters. Now, in your book, Dog is Love, Why and How Your Dog Loves You, you um, it says right in the beginning that you're helping to usher in a new era. One in which love, not intelligence or submission, is at the heart of the human canine relationship. Can you expand on that a little bit more? Explain that. Sure. So for a long time, people have thought that dogs were so successful in human society because dogs had a special form of intelligence, that they had a special way of grasping what we were thinking. Right. That was a, has been a widespread belief for some time. And when I started studying dog behavior, I realized that I couldn't go along with that story, Victoria. It, I realized that, that, OK, there are smart dogs out there. I don't want to, you know, I get hate mail all the time. From people telling me my dog can do this and my dog can do that. OK, there are smart dogs out there. But by and large, if you've spent any time with any other species, and, you know, traditional animal psychologists work with rats and pigeons. Well, they can learn to do smart things, too. There's not really anything that striking about the intelligence of the average dog. 
There really isn't. But there is something stunningly remarkable about dogs, and that is their unfettered, unbounded desire, capacity, and drive to form strong emotional connections. It's the emotional connectedness that makes dogs stand out and is, I think, the, the secret of their success in human society. It's because we can tell that they want to love us that we, in turn, reciprocate their affection. They draw it out of us. That is the magic of dogs to me. Now, um, what degree are human abilities to think and communicate special to us? And to what extent are they shared in other species? That's a great question, Victoria. So I think that each species has their own way of thinking and communicating. So I think that our human language and our human thoughts are special to us, just like the communication and thoughts of fish are special to fish. And I think dogs have their own ways of thinking and their own ways of communicating. But what I find so fascinating is that although human beings communicate in our way and dogs communicate in their way, that we actually, at least at an emotional level, understand each other so very, very well. So our dogs are very sensitive to our moods, right? They're very aware to the point that you can easily fool a dog by pretending to cry. and Your dog will come and console you. People did this as an experiment in London. It's really interesting. And likewise, we can tell. You, anybody who lives with a dog can tell whether their dog is happy or sad, despite the fact that their dogs, the way their dog communicates that, is quite different from how we communicate our happiness and sadness. I mean, I like sometimes it talks to, to point out to people, you know, humans don't have tails and we don't wag our arms the way a dog wags its tail, right? And yet you see a dog wagging its tail happily and nine times out of 10 people can correctly read that. And on the other hand, when the dog tucks its tail between his legs because he's, he's afraid, People understand that, despite the fact we have nothing equivalent that we can do. We don't have hackles on the back of our neck. And very few of us can move our ears in that beautiful, expressive way that dogs do, right? And yet we read their behavior and their, their communicative expression, and they read ours, even though they're so very different. So I think that's, that's part of the beauty and magic of living with dogs, is that emotional communication. Now, um, I, I in the book, you talk a little bit about anthropomorphizing, and I really liked a piece that you'd written when you were said, you know, people are so scared of anthropomorphizing, but actually a hint is permissible, even proper. And I say hooray to that. Could you explain what you meant to our viewers? Because because the 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 problem that I have, obviously we can't anthropomorphize too much, that is put our human feelings on dogs too much. But at the same time, if we if we treat them like a completely separate species that doesn't share anything with us, then I think we're doing them a disservice. So can you explain what you were um, were thinking when you wrote that? Sure. So <laughs> it's kind of ironic because I have been before for many years. I have been critical of other scientists who I feel anthropomorphize animals too much. And I think we need to we need to recognize and we need to relish the difference between ourselves and other species. We're not on a planet surrounded by people who are dressed up as dogs and people who are dressed up as gorillas who are really just the same as us. They just look a bit different. No, they really do have completely different psychological existences. That's something I relish. But at the same time, there are certain very basic things that are similar across many, many species. So many species learn in very similar ways. So the ways we train our dog, you can use them to train your children. You can use them in principle, at least, to train your wife or husband, right? These basic mechanisms of conditioning, as we call them, the most basic forms of learning, they are conserved. They're the same in many different species. And the other thing that's conserved which is so particularly relevant to understanding our dogs. The other thing that's concerned is emotion. So the basic emotions, happiness, sadness, loneliness, pleasure in reunion, love, hatred, 
these very basic emotions are conserved across many different species. And that's, I think, the essential bridge that enables us to have the rich relationship that we do with our dogs, that we share these emotions and we can see them in each other and share in them. So are you saying that dogs can hate? I... <laughs> this is an interesting you one because because a lot of people will argue saying no, dogs can't feel angry, and when they bite, it's only through fear. And, um, but but I, I feel like they are angry sometimes. And and I, I mean, am I, am I anthropomorphizing that, or or truly are we again doing dogs a disservice because we're saying, well, they don't have that ability to actually feel that frustration and that anger that comes through frustration and possibly hate wow you caught me improvising a little bit oh i totally I caught you improvising i put you on the spot i'm so sorry <laughs> <laughs> well so the thing is the thing is i primarily and certainly with the book dog is love i i primarily research and have a professional interest in positive emotions connecting emotions i'm so so I'm now walking outside my professional expertise when I say that I see no reason why dogs should not experience the basic negative emotions like um, hatred, anger. The main the main thing I would I would I would emphasize for your listeners and viewers is that we should be careful not to ascribe to our dogs more complex emotions. So basic emotions of attraction, repulsion, love, hate. I'm pretty confident that dogs experience those. But then there are emotions where you really have to think harder to know you're having the emotion. So an emotion like guilt, for example. To feel guilty, you need to understand what the rules were and you need to understand that even though you might not be punished, you should feel bad for having broken a rule. Now, that, re that requires several layers of additional thinking beyond just the basic emotions of love and hate, of attraction and repulsion. And I doubt very much, and indeed there are some interesting studies that suggest dogs do not experience guilt. They can, they can feel bad because you are disappointed in them. They, can, they experience the social emotion of I've done something wrong. But they don't experience the cognition, the intellectual layers that enable them to understand there was a rule and I broke that rule. That kind of layering of cognition and emotion is less likely to be present in our dogs. So then are you saying that, um, well, when we're, when we're young, we're taught almost to feel shame. Yeah. Um, we're, we're taught that. It's a learned behavior. Well, it's a learned I guess could we say it's a learned behavior or it's from from our parents that right. we are taught to feel shameful if we've done something bad. So are you saying that guilt and that ability to feel shameful are very closely linked that we don't think that our dogs have that 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 level of complexity to be able to feel guilty? Right. So I don't think. And as I said, there have been two or three studies now. Uh, Alexander Horowitz in New York started this, and then there have been others as well. Uh, dogs really do not seem to experience guilt or shame. They can, if they're caught doing something wrong, they can they can experience uh, a recognition that they've done wrong. But that's because you're there. If you're not there, dogs will happily do things they ought to be feeling guilty about. But if they're not caught, they don't feel guilty because they don't actually experience the, the state of, of guilt and certainly shame. We've been having long discussions over dinner about all the embarrassing places that my dog now chooses to poop as we. Yeah, we won't go there. <laughs> that's uh, yeah, that's like my Jasmine when I first got her when she was six months old. She actually threw up and uh, three, she, she threw up poop that she'd eaten into my husband's hand. And yeah. as he wasn't that excited to have her in the first place, and I was trying to uh, create that emotional bond between them, that really didn't help my cause. But anyway, he adores her now. So let's wow. just take a quick break and we will be back. 
A quick break here to get in a word from this episode's sponsor, the Victoria Stowell Academy. Are you looking for a school that can teach you how to be a professional dog trainer? Interested in adding professional dog training services to your pet business? If you've done any research about dog trainer schools, you know that there are a lot of choices these days. Some schools force you to move to where the classes are held for weeks or sometimes even months. Others only teach certain training techniques exclusively or get bogged down in repetitive drills, which work well in the lab but don't always translate to the real world. Some even focus just on games, even for more serious anxiety-based behavior issues, while others employ dangerous and outdated compulsion-based methods that are based on since-disproven theories and the use of pain, intimidation, or fear. Renowned dog behavior expert Victoria Stilwell founded the Victoria Stilwell Academy for Dog Training and Behavior as an answer to one of the questions she heard most often following the success of her TV show, It's Me or the Dog. How do I become a professional dog trainer? The Victoria Stilwell Academy is founded on a simple mission, to create new generations of successful positive dog trainers around the world. Its flagship dog trainer course teaches students how to use the latest in behavioral science to help owners and their dogs achieve results through its elite combination of its premium content taught by the best faculty, using the most state-of-the-art technological platforms with the most comprehensive curriculum and the power of the most recent advances in the science of adult learning. No other dog training school offers what BSA can in terms of the flexibility of its hybrid learning models and its refusal to compromise on the commitment to comprehensive excellence. Every dog trainer course student is paired with a personalized faculty advisor to help guide them through the course via weekly video conference office hours. And every minute of the course content is delivered through engaging instructor-led videos and accompanying learning resources. Its flexible length allows students to learn from home at their own pace. And an optional premium add-on track is available for those who want to supplement their learning with in-person intensives, local mentor shadowing, and live webinar-style cyber classes. And rather than just focusing on one training style, Dog Trainer Course students develop a comprehensive toolbox while pledging to use only force-free positive dog training tools and methods as professionals. VSA also teaches human psychology for effective client interaction as well as accessible and actionable business marketing and branding so that students' business can reach their fullest potential. Not to mention, VSA students graduate as certified dog trainers with the prestige of the Victoria Stillwell Academy name and the power of Victoria and the Positively brand at their backs as they launch or expand their dog training businesses around the world. So if you're ready to get serious about having fun, turning your passion into your profession, and changing the world one dog at a time, the Victoria Stillwell Academy is the place for you. Enrollment coordinators are standing by to help you apply or answer any questions you may have. So visit vsdogtrainingacademy.com today and find out how the Victoria Stillwell Academy can help you chase your dreams of becoming a certified professional dog trainer. Again, that's vsdogtrainingacademy.com. vsdogtrainingacademy.com. The Victoria Stillwell Academy, the future of dog training. Okay, we're back with Clive Wynn. This is just fascinating. I could talk to you all day, and I'm so excited for you to speak at the Dog Behavior Conference uh, on May 9th and 10th. Guys, if you haven't registered, go to positively.com slash DBC to find out more information because then you're going to listen to a whole lot more of Clive Wynn and some other great speakers. But um, another quote that I saw in your book, which I, I, I love, Could be quite controversial, but I love. Ignoring their need for love, you write, is as unethical as denying them a healthy diet and exercise. I almost cheered when I did it. I smiled a big smile when I read that. Well, thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's I think it's a tragedy. Why do we why do we want to have dogs in our homes, Victoria? We want to have them in our homes. Okay, there are a handful of people who actually go sniffing truffles in the forests of France or whatever, right? But the vast majority of us, we're not using our dogs for any practical purpose. We want them in our homes because it's such a rich experience to have this being with you who loves you no matter what kind of a mess you make of things, right? That's that's a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. So we bring them into our homes because we recognize and we relish 
their wonderfully engaging, emotional, loving natures. And then we leave at 7.30 in the morning and we leave them in solitary confinement for 8, 10, 12 hours of the day. And I think that's, that's utterly wrong. It's just wrong to take these beings that we love for their highly sociable nature and then isolate them for almost the whole period of the day that at least we would normally be awake, right? And, and I understand. I'm, I'm very, very privileged. I, I already said I work from home a lot, even under normal circumstances. Uh, so our dog doesn't get left alone. I understand not everybody can have that kind of a lifestyle. But, you know, in Sweden, there's a regulation that you must not leave your dog home alone for more than four hours at a stretch. Now, I'm not suggesting that the United States or the United Kingdom should adopt Swedish law and regulations. But I do say that if you're thinking about getting a dog, look at your life and check to make sure that there is indeed a dog shaped space in your life. If you're, you know, the number of students I have come and talk to me about possibly wanting to get a dog. And I say, then what kind of a life are you leading at the moment? You know, are you up early in the morning to study and, you know, you've got classes during the day and then either in the evening you're studying hard for an exam or you're out with your friends or whatever. It's possible that your life doesn't at this point have a dog shaped space in it. And you'd be better off waiting until there indeed is a circumstance that you can really take on a dog. I always tell yeah. people that I waited till I was 35 before I could have a dog. 35. How old was I when I got? I can't, I, it would take me too long to remember. But yeah, I mean, I've had stretches. I, I talk about it in, in my book, Dog is Love. I had stretches. I was moving between Australia and the United States, and we had a baby, and we didn't know if we would stay in the United States. And so we lived without a dog. And life is better with a dog, but that was just a phase where it wasn't an option. Yeah, life is much better with a dog. I concur <laughs> on that one. Um <laughs> Well, we're we're nearly at the end, but I did want to ask you about this uh, about our hearts beating in synchronicity. We sure. know, I mean, we talk a lot on this podcast, or we have talked a lot about the hormone oxytocin, that being the sort of the attachment, the love, the bonding hormone. But um, what about these? What about our hearts beating in synchronicity with dogs? Well, absolutely. So, so this will be part of my presentation for the conference. Uh, I have, I was just putting together the slides. So I have the slides. This was a study out of Australia where they put heart rate monitors on the chest of some people and on the chest of their dog. And they had them just sit down next to each other, sit down next to each other and recorded simultaneously the heartbeats in the dog and the person. And they were able to see that as the person and the dog came together and rested together, not only did their heart rates go down, which is normal when you're relaxing, but that they actually literally beat, it as, beat as one, two hearts beating as one, quite literally. The heart beats became synchronized. So I'm going to talk about that. So I, I have um, love, love between dogs and people in the heart. I'm going to talk about the oxytocin research that you mentioned from uh, Japan, Azubu University in the suburbs of Tokyo. I'm going to talk about uh, love between people and dogs in the brain, the research of Gregory Burns at Emory University in Atlanta, who train, has trained dogs to lie perfectly still in MRI scanners so you can see their brain activity, and that sheds light on, um, on, on how dogs' bodies make it possible for dogs to love people. And I'm also going to talk about the genetic research that I've been involved in myself, where we've actually identified three genes that mutated in the journey from wolf to dog and contribute to the exceptional loving nature of dogs. So I'm going to talk about love in the bodies of dogs at multiple, multiple levels. And that is why I am so excited that you can join us for those of you who um, haven't heard of the National Dog Behavior Conference, it's a conference that we host every year in the United Kingdom. But because of coronavirus, we had to cancel it. And we were so upset about having to do that and letting everybody down that we decided to put it online. And because we put it online, it meant that we could have more speakers. And who better to ask than Clive Wynn? And so we are so excited. Um, Clive, I cannot wait to hear more 
of your talk and your presentation. May the 9th, 10th, guys, if you want to hear more. But also, if you can't come and you can't register for the conference, or even if you can, I would definitely encourage you to get Clive's book. This is a fascinating read. And for dog geeks like I know you are, and like me, that you're going to love this. And it's also, it's really relatable. I know that you know, you ground a lot of this in science, but this is relatable. This is not a scientific book. It's not heavy. You don't have to go, oh God, now I got to pick this up again. No, this is, this is a heartfelt, lovely, personal journey, um, but also fascinating journey, um, backed up with science, of course, uh, about dog is love and why and how your dog loves you. So Clive, thank you so much for joining us and I will see you in a few weeks time. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Victoria. This has been fun. I can't wait for the conference. Didn't I tell you? Didn't I promise you? Isn't he amazing? Yes, he is. And again, if you want to hear him speak May 9th and 10th, the Dog Behavior Conference, do register, do join us. It is going to be live. You're going to be able to answer questions live as well for two days. Come and be part of our community and learn more about your dog or the dogs that you work with. That's it for this podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Next week, I will be speaking to another incredible guest. And for those of you who are saying, where's Holly? She's here. She's around. And she will be back with us very soon. Until then, take care, everybody. Be safe. And thank you so much for listening. Thanks for tuning in to Victoria Stilwell's Positively Podcast. For more information, visit Positively.com. Get connected on Facebook and YouTube as Victoria Stilwell or follow her on Twitter at Victoria S. Be sure to tune in next time as Victoria helps to change dogs' lives positively.